So I'm very happy to introduce our own Arman Ramim. So Arman was a student in our department. He went off elsewhere for a while, but we managed to attract him back as a faculty member. Um, so how long have you been here? Actually, it's longer than about two years. Two years already. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, he's going to talk about something which is not his research, but something closely related to his to his uh, way of doing research, which is sort of how to combine your your real life and well being with your academic life. So, uh, so it'll be a little bit different this week, but of interest to everybody, hopefully. Arman, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Douglas. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, um, what I wish to really emphasize today is that this is a really a personal perspective and it's, it's please have that in mind. And I hope that this creates uh, an, a venue for further discussion and insights uh, from you. Um, so what, and, and the target audience uh, that I have for this uh, lecture is uh, the, uh, those who are undergoing training and also uh, junior faculty, but I believe these kind of discussions would be very helpful, I think, for a broad um, uh, 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 membership of, of, of our faculty and our department. Um, so what I'm going to talk about what may lie ahead for those of you considering the academic pathway. And then taking a step back, uh, looking at the big picture, and then some of my thoughts and perspectives on having a successful and fulfilling uh, career. What I want to share with you, first of all, is that a cynical perspective of what may actually lie ahead. And this is something that uh, uh, quite often takes place. Um, and it involves being pushed by a system based on what it, it values, you know, papers, published or perish, grants, get them or get out, and lectures and teachings and mentees, and you sort of accumulate and you build up your CV so that you're allowed to move up and, and be promoted to the next stage. Um, learning tricks on how to hack the system, you know, such as writing papers and replying to reviewers in a way that they like it and covering up your own shortcomings. Writing grants using a certain language, you know, keep writing, feel miserable doing it, be rejected grant after grant until you figure it out. This perspective is one I bring with me from the US because the competition for getting funded um, for example, with the National Institute of Health was extremely, extremely competitive at the time I was there. And it continues to be like that. And I think in, in, in light of what is happening with COVID, it is quite likely that um, uh, you know, funding might become tighter in the future in Canada as well. Um, and finally, recycle teaching material year after year. So clearly you see this is a kind of a cynical perspective on this. And then you know, the aim being to reach this 10-year utopia and you sort of work in a way to reach a place where you cannot be fired. And once you're there, you're an entirely different person for better or quite possibly worse, which is something I've clearly witnessed in others and in myself. And, you know, so if, you know, if, if working under this kind of paradigm, you really become a different entity. And once you're there, um, we're dealing with a different human being. Um, and so, so, so these are some of my concerns. And so, so to address that, I just want to take a step back and just to provide some reflections more on a positive note on, 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 you know, and this is something I'll share that with you is something that I spent quite some time um, thinking about, you know, what is it that is valuable and meaningful um, in the context of being in an academic setting? I think one of the top ones for me is that fact that we're really employed to learn and I, I just don't think that can be underestimated, the value and the beauty of that, that we're, we're, we're employed to learn day after day and to also pursue research that we find to be truly interesting and invigorating. So I think that's, that's just an important aspect of what we do and to make new discoveries that might be transformative and to really disseminate and pass on our learning and experiences and sort of passing on the torch. I had this comment from, one of my mentors once, he said, you don't really know your mentor's mentors, but clearly they, they must have made, they have made a big difference in your life. And, you know, thinking about that, I know also that my mentees, mentees will probably not know me uh, or ma vast majority of them will, 
vast majority of them will probably not. Uh, but just reflecting on the idea that we are here, this generation of scientists, we are trying to pass on the torch of learning to the next generation. I think that's extremely valuable and, and meaningful. Um, one of the things that I really want to emphasize in this uh, talk is the importance of putting yourself in the right company of the right people. I believe there's nothing, zero, zilch, zip, nada, nothing that replaces direct receptive interaction with human beings. There's nothing, there's nothing that replaces direct interaction with human beings. Um, so being in the company of um, strong friends is, is, is obviously a very important point. Seeking um, mentors and, um, you know, there's different ways to seek mentors. And I think this is something that in the academic setting, some of us may not be fully aware of and not appreciate. And I did not appreciate either early on, which I'll share with you. And there's different, uh, you know, uh, different ways to do this. You're working with a mentor or working with a coach. And there's differences between these, but both are very uh, valuable. Uh, a mentor is uh, someone that you sort of... Um, approach and shares wisdom with you, sort of speaks with you, um, passes on their learning to you. And a coach is um, someone that sort of speaks instead of with you, sort of to you and shares special knowledge. And, and coaching tends to be more short term where you, 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 you have a coach and you speak with a coach about a particular uh, aspect of your work or your personality that you would like to work on. And you spend a lot of time sort of talking about that. Whereas a mentor is more in a more sort of a, uh, in a different environment where you, re, you, you know, I think it's great for, for us to be able to approach somebody that we respect a lot, we want to learn from and say, hey, do you mind if, if on a monthly basis we meet even half an hour, you know, used to be meeting over lunch, for example, um, you know, in this COVID era, it could be in a different context. Um, so can I meet with you? Can I learn from you? And, you know, people are often um, um, very receptive to that. You'd be surprised by how people would be receptive, receptive to, to mentoring you. Um, I personally suffered early on. So I was recruited by, uh, when I got my PhD here at UBC, um, I was recruited by Johns Hopkins University. Um, and I did something quite rare. I, I negotiated with them. Um, to be promoted to faculty directly, which is very rare. And I was all excited about that, right? I'm becoming an assistant professor only within a few months of having my PhD, so something quite rare. And I thought, you know, I was on top of the world. But when I, and it's not even something you really asked for ordinarily. And I was kind of naive because I didn't, you know, sometimes you know how you ask for something because you don't know that it's not possible. And then because you ask for it, it becomes possible. But still, what I learned later on is that I missed out on having, you know, let's say, for example, a postdoc advisor, a mentor to really teach me. So I learned a number of things um, uh, on my own and I suffered because I did not have that direct, valuable mentorship that I badly needed after getting my, my PhD. So, so, um, uh, um, so I had to pick things up on my own and that definitely delayed my progress. And, but it did teach me to value mentorship. Um, I want to share with you some specific suggestions um, about some of the aspects of growth and um, success in academia. Again, these are my personal reflections that I want to share with you. First of all, I mean, there's a different talk that, that I've given. I've given it within our department and also to the Department of Radiology to, um, to, to, um, to different audiences. And this one you can listen to, it's, uh, on, it's a video talk in 11 Practical Steps for Effective Time Management in a Distracted World. And I'm not gonna talk about this at all, but this has both a philosopher's perspective to time management and also a manager's perspective to time management. So I encourage you to consider watching that and, and share some of my thoughts about um, working more effectively uh, with you. Um, and some of these might surprise, surprise you. Uh, I want to share with you 12 books that I have found to be extremely meaningful and valuable to me. I'm going to go through them one by one, uh, at least the first six books. This is a really good book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, it, it's written over 25 years ago and, and by Stephen Covey, who's highly respected. For years, uh, one of my mentors, which I later found at, at Johns Hopkins, 
he would ask me to read this book and I for whatever reason, or he would suggest me to read this book and I kind of refused. I just didn't like the title. It's like, what is that? Seven Habits. But Lara recognizes it's an extremely good book. These habits build on top of each other. So you have to have habit one in order to have habit two, and have habit two in order to have habit three and so on and so forth. Uh, really good book. Uh, Crucial Conversations was very important to me. You know, it emphasized the fact that biologically we human beings tend to respond to to difficult situations either by taking uh, flight or by fight. So either fight or flight. And so we're at, we either become very aggressive or become very passive and sort of move around it. But that there is a really, for human beings, there's a third alternative and that is to engage uh, with the problem and to, to engage with it and to have very good conversations and meaningful conversations. So I, for example, caught myself uh, it really revealed to me that I was m- more of those people that take flight and I sort of try to avoid conversations. And I think this really uh, was transformative for me. There's a really good book called, called Good to Great. It, it's about um, certain companies that do really well and certain uh, companies in the same sectors that do not do really well. And what is the difference between them? And Jim Collins, and he has a big team of researchers for him, he, he, he says that initially, I really didn't want to look for what the qualities of the CEOs of the companies are. Discovering, even though they were not looking for this, that the CEOs did make a big difference. And they identified these kind of people, type five personalities, uh, they call them, that um, are people who are not self-driven or self-centered. Their focus is on not just on their own success. At the same time, they're very, very ambitious. So these kind of personalities are people who are ambitious, who are driven, but not just for themselves. And they're looking at the interests of the, uh, the bigger audience uh, of, 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 for example, their, 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 their team members, et cetera. So, you know, that really educated me on, on the idea of the importance of the personality and, and having ambition, but, but higher ambitions. And also one of the key phrases that I keep mentioning to, to my lab members is this phrase in this book, and there's a whole chapter on it about the fact that first get the right people on the bus and then decide where the bus is going. So instead of really predefining what your research interests are, it's far more important, as many of you have experienced, to have brilliant and driven and trustworthy members of the lab that you recruit and they help you decide where the bus of research essentially and productivity in your lab goes. The War of Art is a fantastic book. You've heard of the book Art of War, probably. It's by a Chinese general, Senju, who is a pretty good book some, for whatever reason, popular with salespeople, salesmen, salesmen and women. But The War of Art is, is, is a book that I find to be even better. It's, it's by an author who, um, who, who talks about mental blocks, you know, on a daily basis facing this thing he refers to as res, uh, resistance that comes at you and wants you to stop from producing your best work on a day. It's a daily battle. And, you know, we are artists when you really think about it. If I think a good scientist has to be a good artist. We have to be able to, to, to think artistically, to be able to express ourselves um, uh, um, and to explain the work that we're doing. So I think uh, this is a good book. Yeah, Give and Take by, by Adam Grant is a really good book. It talks about three kinds of types of people. Those who are takers, essentially taking advantage of other people. Those who are matchers, which are most of us, that we try to be fair, you know, I'll give you some, you give me some. And then givers, those who give without expecting anything in return. And he kind of discovers and uh, the fact that in the big ladder of success, the givers end up being the people at the very, very bottom of the ladder of success, but also the people at the very, very top of the ladder of success. And he argues what kind of, what these two different, different um, uh, giving styles there, but he really makes a strong argument that those who have a giving style can succeed tremendously. Um, So this is also a good book. This book, some of you um, might have read, it's really a book that was written in the seventies, referred to as probably the most widely read book of popular philosophy um, ever, probably, at least back then when it was, you know, being very successful. talking about the fact that you can really do something very, very specific and at the same time have, have, have sublime thinking. It's a pretty good book. It's a very, very good book. It's, it makes you think on, on many frontiers and the title kind of um, might not exactly tell you what it's all about. It's just a fantastic book. Here are six other books that I just quickly want to go over. Two by Cal Newport on deep work and on 
um, how we deal with 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 uh, the digital world. You know how we should we should stay focused in a noisy world. Um, this is a book one of my mentors suggested that I read. It's about Shackleton's um, uh, journey to the south um, to T Antarctica in the, in the uh, previous century, and how they ended up actually getting stranded and stuck on an iceberg for one year and a half, and how this team survives. The book. Uh, when you read it, it's really not about leadership. But once you read it, it just gets under your skin uh, on what a tremendously good leader like Shackleton actually does when people are undergoing, you know, severe challenges. Um, here's another really good book by Adam Grant on originals. I think I'll refer to this later. And a couple of other good books. This book has a pretty weird title, but it's actually a very good book um, for those, you know, looking at academic uh, leadership, um, you know, recognizing that, uh, uh, you know, leadership in an academic environment is totally different than, than, than in a, uh, let's say, a business or entrepreneurial environment, um, because you're dealing with very more independent people, um, you know, Professor Inc., Professor Inc., Professor Inc., right? So, um, and just understanding that better human resource aspects, many other aspects. Um, so what I would say is it's very important for, for, I would say for, for me and for us in the academic world to be on a mission, to actually, you know, I have a mission statement as I've learned from my mentors, you know, what is it that I wanna create? What is, what is the, what is my legacy? Like thinking about this for hours and hours and days and days, and what is your legacy? What do you want to be known for? And thinking of yourself as a cause and working on it, refining it, sharing it, uh, crystallizing, you know, your intentionality. Uh, and that, by the way, is one of the most important things to time management, uh, as I refer to in my other talk. Um, I'm just going to share with you my own team's mission statement. I have a personal mission statement. I have a professional mission statement. And I have a lab, you know, slash team mission statement. And I'm just going to share mine with you. It's totally personal. It's related to, to our lab. And this is something we've arrived at with hours after hours and hours of discussion with our team members. Um, and this is where it's, it keeps me refined, right? But it's three items here. Again, it's just very specific, but I just want to share that with you. So pursue work that is innovative and rigorous with an eye on translation to state-of-the-art patient, patient care and to impact quality of life, meaningful work. Um, so these are all in the context of what I do, which is medical physics. Attract active collaborations, including support of world-class physicians and scientists to define the future of nuclear medicine, imaging, and therapy. So emphasizing collaborative work. And finally, provide a training and mentoring environment to help discover the potentials within each member of the team to reach their best and to become next generation of global experts, so active mentorship. So for me, having formulated these, then spending hour after hour with, with our trainees in meetings is not considered to be by any means a waste of time. It is part of my mission. It is something that, that has value and importance to me and to our team. And you know, spending a lot of time going after collaborators is very meaningful. And doing work and you know, publishing papers is something, but doing kind of a kind of publication that is transformative or aiming for such work, you know, therefore it's being rigorous, uh, for example, um, is, is something else. So, so these have helped me. One of my mentors, which I used to have, he said he, once he went to his mentor, who was the head of uh, our department of radiology in my former university, who ended up becoming the head of the National Institute of Health uh, at uh, NIH um, and uh, Dr. Zerhoni. He said, Dr. Zerhoni told him, um, he said, Dave, that's my former mentor, Dr. Yusam, Dave Yusam, you, in order for you to really succeed and do well, you should really know the difference between doing things right versus doing the right things. And then Dave said, oh, great, great comment, great feedback. And then when he left the meeting, he said, what the heck was he talking about? Um, now you can think about this more, but um, it's, it's a, such an important topic and, uh, and, 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 and concept that we first have to really identify the right things and then we should do them right. Whereas often just so that we're not feeling bad about what we're doing, such as in my early years at Hopkins, I would really, I was not being productive. I was wasting my time checking a lot of news, for example, first thing I got to work, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, at the end of the day, I would feel so bad 
that I would write down some of the things I've done and pat myself on the back. But later I recognized I was just trying to write down the things I've done right just to feel good, but I was not doing the right things, things that were consistent with my mission, things that were of value and important. Um, so, so I think the point is to first really identify um, the right things and arrive at them, arrive at those and formulate them, which I'll talk to you a little bit later about how to formulate them and then doing those right things right. Um, another thing I've learned is the fact that we often hear stand tall to be seen is actually not true and not correct uh, because I think to me that implies having limited scope. Whereas I believe that one has to really stand wide in order to stand tall. You know, one really has to broaden their learning, their perspectives, their experiences, and sort of move in, move in different directions. You know, um, um, I remember my dad used to um, provide me with, with a comment, which was, it had, the, had the appearance of a compliment. He would say, you're kind of like, you know, the absent-minded physicist that, you know, one day you're probably gonna cook or boil or watch or something like that. And after a while I recognized this is not exactly a compliment to be proud of, to be absent-minded or perhaps to be of limited scope or to be uh, one dimensional is not something to be proud of. Uh, and it's not a requirement of being a successful, you know, academic and scientist and physicist and professional. So um, I think that's very important. And in his book, Originals, he, uh, Adam Grant also really touches on this point, you know, looking at profiles of uh, those who have won the uh, Nobel Prize, how these people had diverse range. You know, you know how you have actors who have a wide range in acting, similarly in science, the ability, for example, of Nobel Prize winners, of, of uh, most of them or many of them, to move around in different subfields and not to get stuck in, in one area. And also for, for them to even do other stuff, like some of these, some of them are performers, you know, acting as clowns or, or you know, stage performers and sort of moving around and trying different things. I, I really like this saying uh, by Linus Pauling, uh, which you've uh, all heard, the best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. And um, that is totally true. Um, I'll give you one example, Shakespeare, um, which obviously is what highly respected. Shakespeare, he wrote three plays in a span of five years. We tend to think that these people kept getting better and better, but he wrote three plays in the span of five years, Macbeth, King Lear, and some other play whose name I forget, which and I don't really care to remember because it was not good at all, but he wrote them all within the same span of time. He was trying different things. He was moving around. It's not like he was producing, you know, less and less um, lower quality works. He was just producing a lot of work and some of them end up, ended up being masterpieces. And again, many of you here would recognize the idea that sometimes we're trying, we're working on different ideas and papers and some of them to our own surprise end up being uh, more interesting and, and, and noticed by others. Um, awaiting inspiration is very important. You know, taking long walks or whatever helps you look for deep insights. Not hiding your ideas from others. I think it's a good idea. You know, I've heard people saying, you know, um, don't, don't even go to conferences. People are going to scoop your ideas. Just first publish a paper, then you get your idea, ideas out there. Obviously, there's a risk associated with sharing your ideas with other people, but the benefits are tremendous. You know, again, if our mission is to advance learning, um, hiding your ideas, however you think about it, probably doesn't fit within that mission. Um, so, so, so even if you don't have a conference paper, you know, at even an earlier stage, sometimes sharing your ideas with others can be tremendously valuable. First of all, they may tell you, hey, by the way, we've tried this, it doesn't work. Or you may start working together. You know, a lot of great things happen when you open up. Clearly there's an element of risk. Clearly one of your works will in the future be scooped, but so what? You know, there's plenty of where that came from. It's you, you have infinite uh, 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 possibilities within you to, to come up with new ideas. And again, the point is to advance the science. So reaching out, being open to others, to your own deep thinking. Um, again, being open, being receptive, I think is tremendously valuable. I love this quote by, by Ali, the, not the boxer, but the original Ali. He said, the first opinion of the person of intellect is the last opinion of an ignorant person. So I think that's very important, not getting stuck 
to one idea, being able to move around. You know, within philosophy, for example, there's different schools. You know, we have continental philosophy, we have analytic philosophy, and you know, the analytics tend to be more combative, tend to really be more critical, whereas the uh, continental philosophers tend to build on top of each other. And sometimes we have to do one of the two. Sometimes you build on top of uh, your prior work in a creative way, but sometimes you really have to depart from your prior work and just not, you know, move on and try different things. Um, on publications, I would say, again, most interesting papers can actually occur unexpected, unexpectedly. So being productive is probably what matters uh, a lot. Um, I have had great experiences with writing high quality review papers, you know, sort of establishing me as someone who kind of really understands the field and also identifying the, the, the gaps and the shortcomings and, and a couple of you know good papers happening because I wrote this review paper and recognizing you know, something needs to be done. Um, helping others, um, I think is important. You know, there, I was uh, visiting um, an institution uh, over a decade ago in my home country, Iran. And, you know, I was really trying to be helpful and to help them out. And, you know, I reached out to them. I said, what can I do to contribute? Um, and at the end of the day, they ended up helping me more than I helped them. A good number of my publications came because of my relationships with them. I ended up having really fantastic visits um, to my home country and, and uh, great collaborations, great ex experiences. And again, I was intending to help them, but it ended up helping me more. Um, and I'm sure many of you could have, would have examples of this. Um, one thing I would again, sort of say, not again, this is, a, I think, a new comment, is uh, spending a lot of time refining your title of your paper or even its abstract is important. I've seen, I've seen great quality work that has been hidden under a terrible title or an abstract. I think you definitely lose your audience um, if you do not think about that. So, but, so this doesn't take as humongous a time as writing a paper, you know, just, just coming back, keep looking at your title of your paper, kind of like your CV is something, it's like a work of art, right? It's like you keep looking at it, you, you keep refining it. Uh, it's like a sculpture, right? And, and you try to do a better job of it. Um, publishing conference papers, I think is tremendously good. Preprints, I, I'm thankful that there's a movement in this direction that you publish your work prior to it being formally published. Oh, I know there are concerns with preprints, but I think, um, you know, getting your ideas out there can be valuable. Um, I would say being generous with who you include as a co-author can be very, very valuable. Uh, sometimes there's gray areas, like you're kind of unsure, should I put this person as a co-author or I really could do with putting this person as a, uh, in, in, the, in the acknowledgement section. I think putting uh, people that you can, you know, say within that gray zone that you know, being, being generous with them, putting them as co-authors, I think is, 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 a, is, is a good thing to do. Um, it's not the right thing to do. It's more than right. It's, a, it's, the, it's the kind thing to do, right? Um, of course, assuming that they have contributed, again, it's a gray, gray area, not if they totally don't deserve to be co-authors, um, um, which has its own problems if you do that. Um, but, but I think many good things, again, first of all, it's, it's a good thing to do, but on top of that, great things can happen. They, they may end up promoting your work better. It creates trust, really great relationships, you know, to, to, recognizing that you value them and, and, and be willing to, 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 to work with you more. On grants, I would say, um, you know, using grants as an opportunity to think very big is very exciting. Uh, developing, you know, thinking about how you're going to get there, you know, thinking and imagining and daydreaming, you know, many specific possible pathways to get there. I have a, a time slot on my uh, calendar that I call daydreaming. You know, it's a one hour slot every month. I don't necessarily do it, unfortunately, all the time, but it's there and it, it's there. I mean, you know, I want you, Armand, to daydream. Um, I think that's an important thing. Um, forming new collaborations, getting lots and lots of support letters, I think really helps and not hesitating to draft them yourself, kind of like how many of you have drafted reference letters. Uh, uh, many of us have done this in the past, but uh, similarly drafting support letters, just getting more uh, support letters and grants, I think is valuable. And Often, you know, these support letters and these creating those relationships before you write the paper actually sets in place a whole machinery and a whole engine where even if you don't get funded, you can work together. And becoming a, a, a great storyteller, I think is important. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, uh, looking at uh, 
others' grants, I think is very important. Asking others, once they trust you somewhat, to give you samples of their successful grants. Um, you know, telling them you will not share with a single soul. Uh, thankfully, at, at Hopkins, we have um, uh, this great entity uh, that actually has, um, uh, has uh, scores of other people's grants shared. So I think that's already a great, uh, great resource. Uh, but um, also asking, you know, people that can trust you. Asking them what are a few key things that have made them successful in grant writing, attending workshops about grant writing, I think is important. Read, read, read good writing diverse fields. Um, I was uh, reading somewhere that uh, Winston Churchill, who was a fantastic orator, he, 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 he had, there's this amazing set of books uh, called uh, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbons, just tremendously good books. And both in terms of content and in terms of style and the beauty of and the elegance of the language and the way he writes. And, and Churchill says that, you know, I, I wrote triumphantly through these books, you know, cover to cover, and uh, I devoured them. And I think that was reflected in, in, in how successful he was in his oration, et cetera. I think just reading good writing diverse fields can make us uh, better express ourselves and, and just being very valuable to us. Um, this is a very specific suggestion applicable only to some of us. Um, for example, in medical, physics, there is an opportunity often to become board certified. And sometimes you don't have to get board certified. But I've, my personal experience with this is if you can be board certified, I think it's a good opportunity. Widens your learning, makes you and takes you to places that you normally don't want to be and makes you and forces you to learn stuff. Widens your hiring opportunities and may enable you to better negotiate your salary. So that's a, that's a comment there. As far as coming Communication is obviously communicating well is important. Getting yourself invited to give talks, I think is important. One of the great comments I once got from my head of my former department uh, where I was, he said, Armand, get yourself invited to give talks. And that has really worked well for me because it really allows me to practice more, to share my work with others, to create collaborations. Uh, and that's great. In fact, when you think about it, this talk I'm giving to you right now is exactly that's what happened. So I, I approached the Douglas and I said, Doug, uh, I, uh, I, I gave this other talk that was received well. Would you be willing to have this opportunity when I speak? And he was gracious and said, yeah, yeah, come and give this talk to us. Um, so um, being curious, you know, reaching out, pushing yourself. So I'm actually a, quite a shy person. I am definitely an introvert. And sometimes people don't really believe that. And I think it's totally fine to be an introvert. There's clear evidence that introverts contribute significantly um, uh, to, to many frontiers. Uh, one thing that does happen is that in certain meetings, uh, as, as leaders, people are told, look, if you're asking people's opinions, the extroverts will jump up and they're gonna give you opinions and you're not gonna hear from the introverts. So you gotta go after them and ask them. So often introverts may be left out. And again, you know, team leaders are asked, you know, after the meeting, you know, go after them and tell them, hey, what did you think about that? You know, do you wanna, give me your feedback and then they may open up. But the point is, if you are an introvert, I think it's important for you in a team setting to really push yourself and to share your thoughts. You know, I've always been the guy sitting at the back of the class, but over the years, I guess I've pushed myself to come and sit more at the front of the class, uh, so to say. Um, and, and, you know, they say one of the downfalls of leaders um, is the fact that they start assuming they're the hub of information, that they know everything, that all information goes through them which is really a downfall. So not assuming that, you know, asking your, the people you work with, the administrators, the trainees in a class, your collabor collaborators questions and being curious about what's going on, I think is very important. Um, having a path plan. Uh, so in addition to a mission statement, sometimes what people do is, is write a path you know, or, or leadership path or whatever path plan. You know, for example, I have a, you know, something that I've refined over the years, it's about 14 paragraphs that sort of has, um, you know, me reflecting on my own um, abilities and shortcomings, especially the shortcomings, you know, what are some of the things that I really need to work on? So I'm just gonna share with you one of those 14 paragraphs, which is on micromanagement, because I've caught myself that I'm a micromanager. This is something I've talked to my mentors and coach about, you know, what do I do about micromanagement? So this is just one statement that I read every month um, to remind myself of the importance of not micro micromanaging others. So I will not micromanage others. I will help them develop and strengthen their cap capacities. 
by extensive discussions early on. So, you know, spending more time as you have a trainee early on to really make them understand and then giving them the freedom to explore, to make mistakes, to learn and to grow over time. I will trust them and give them freedom to find their ways and to make decisions. So this is just an example. This is another great exercise that I think anybody that runs a lab should probably do at least once. It's and if you're running a program of any kind, um, some kind of graduate program or a service program or a clinical program, whatever program, I think it's extremely valuable to do this. So you kind of start from here where this is sort of like what your mission is. Where do you want to be as a lab? Where do you want your lab to be? You know, thinking about the future, thinking about your mission, your vision, your values, all those things, you know, doing daydreaming, thinking about where is it that I want to my lab to be, um, and you know, what is my what what I want my legacy to be—the kind of stuff we sort of talked about before—and then this is the part that many people do not do, and that is developing some kind of metrics. Okay, so you have this, you have daydreamed, but what is? How do you know you will actually be there? How do you know when you get there? So thinking about that is actually quite challenging. You know, is it about publishing the number of my papers, or is it more about publishing in in respectful? you know, high quality journals, or is it about your work being transforming something? Or is it about your trainees being successful, moving on to have wonderful careers? You know, thinking about those aspects is important and, and many other possibilities. And then you start thinking about where you are right now and both internally within your environment and also generally, you know, just looking at the environment in the immediate environment and going out. So sort of like, um, your strengths and weaknesses, and then opportunities and threats. Some people call that SWOT analysis or SWOC analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to or, or challenges. Um, so really just thinking, that, like, re literally going through the exercise, writing down, where are you right now? You know, let's say you're in this field of astrophysics and what, what's going on out there? What's interesting? What are some of the challenges? What's the environment like? You know, all these things, you, you, you write those down. And you sort of try to understand where you are right now, where your environment is at. And then this is a part where you, and this, this whole thing is sort of a strategic doing where you sort of, then you say, okay, based on all these things, how will you get there from here? Uh, and you, and then you, you might actually end up with surprising insights that, you know what, I'm going to do this differently. I shouldn't be focusing on X. I really should be changing X to Y. I should be adding a Z and a W or whatever on top of this. I should be doing things different. So that's a good exercise. Um, there are some questions here that can help you out. I can share the PDF file so anybody that can look at this and go, go through that exercise. Um, so I'm trying to wrap up now. Creating a warm and caring lab environment is obviously very important. Many of you would uh, are extremely good at that. Um, developing empathy, interaction skills, creating meaningful relationships with others, serving others. Uh, being at the service of, of your trainees, I think, is, 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 is meaningful. You know, this idea of servant leadership, right, as opposed to leadership. Um, I think that's, that's very valuable. Opportunities will come at you. Um, engage, you know, engaging lab members, aiming not to micromanage. This is my own personal flaw that I try to work on. Trusting their decisions, giving them space and room for error, not making decisions on everything, letting them decide, delegating ta tasks, creating a fun and exciting environment. Um, you know, for example, in our, in our lab, one of the things that has been transformative recently is we switched to using Slack for better communications. That's just one example. And one of our lab members suggested that we switch to Slack. And then later we switched to Teams because now UBC is offering Teams and it's, it's a fantastic uh, thing to interact between lab members. And we think that many interesting uh, uh, scientific and non-scientific interactions can take place. That's just one example. Um, this is again, uh, on a case by case basis, if you want your work to be translated, this is again, in the context of medical physics, which is what I do, uh, to, to be transformative in a clinical sense, I think is important to, for us, medical physicists to, to engage with practitioners. Um, I think this is applicable to to others. Getting funded by industry, I think, is such a good thing. Like, I get more excited when I get a little fund from industry than a big fund from um, the government. Because when industry funds you, they're more likely to actually take your work seriously and to work with you and hopefully ultimately taking your idea and your concept and, you know, 
to translating it to a, to a product that ends up being uh, uh, impactful. And this, this can be very interesting and fruitful and exciting. And, and you know, not hesitate, hesitating to work with technology development or transfer office. You know, early on in my career, I was a bit naive about this. I thought, well, you know what, I want my ideas to be used by everyone. So I'm not going to patent them. I'm not going to, you know, do this business. But later I learned that actually counterintuitively, if you have a really great idea and you end up disclosing it and ultimately patenting it, it's actually more likely to be translated and to be taken up by industry and to actually be used in practice. Because, you know, when there is a hold on a certain idea that you're having or, or a product that you have, uh, industry looks more favorably on that and feels that they can invest in it further. So it's something to think about. Some more thoughts when I, before I wrap up. Run away from jerks. That's definitely something I've learned and something that I value. Uh, but but um, obviously, first, you have to identify who these people are. And I define this word by people who are genuinely mean-spirited, uh, not people who are, who are idiosyncratic, which, which most of us are anyways. Um, but, uh, you know, I have a list of eight people with whom I'm very close right now who initially I thought they were in this category, but I was totally mistaken. So my initial impressions were wrong. And I literally wrote that. So I teach myself that you're not gonna judge people by just one, two or three interactions. Um, and these people are people I respect a lot and I work with. But once you're pretty sure this person is a jerk, you run away from them. I was reading this, this very interesting writing by, by a really great leader in, 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 in academia who, who also had fantastic uh, administrative leadership experience. And he was giving a whole bunch of advice to people about how to succeed. The first three had nothing to do with science, by the way. You know, the number one was your family. And number two and number three were about financial advice and also about eating well, you know, that stuff. And then later when he came down, he did talk a lot of science, but he also talked about the idea of running away uh, from these kinds of people. Uh, uh, you should not assume that you're going to fix people and people of course change but it's not in your hands and, and and sort of not putting yourself even if you think you're going to benefit from these kind of people running away from them otherwise you're going to likely you're going to be hurt and you're going to regret it attending uh, uh workshops and events to expand your horizons i think is very important work-life balance which is something that is thankfully becoming uh, uh, more of a thing and people are talking more about it, I think it's very important. I, I, I'm not gonna talk about it and I'm not an expert in it. It's definitely something that, that I think is very, very valuable. Um, recognizing what that what you do besides work really impacts how you work so that this continuum of work life and who you are really impacts your work. So, you know, the same person who does whatever you do at home or away from work is the same person that comes to work. So building character is clearly very important um, and recognizing that it is possible to be very very good at something very very specific while at the same time you're having very big intentional you know subline meaningful thinking um, um, so you know Stephen Covey in his seven habits talks about personality versus character and your know, personality is great but and we're sometimes taught to to for quick hacks on you know, how to have good personality, like you know, keep eye contact, or whenever somebody asks you a question, you know, you put the question back to them and be courteous, blah blah blah, all that stuff. But really, uh, it's sort of a bit superficial. And I think at the end of the day, the character really defines things a lot more, at least in the long term, than just some quick personality tricks. Um, Oscar Wilde, I like to saying that education is an admirable thing. But it is well to remember from time to time that nothing that is worth learning can be taught. I think this is a very good point. No matter what you hear in this talk or elsewhere, unless you practice it and you think about it and take the long walks or you whatever makes you think about them more, those, those deep insights coming to you, it's, it's not going to make a difference. So, so really, uh, learning really comes from experience. Um, one of my uh, colleagues' mentors told him this, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Hard work on your job will earn you a living. Hard work on yourself will earn you a fortune, heaven and earth and everything in between. So the idea of working on yourself and your character. Uh, so that's it, thank you. So I really wanna acknowledge my mentors, my colleagues, coaches, teachers, friends, colleagues and trainees. And thank you very much.